Hi, thank you for watching Digging to China. I'm Dong Xiong. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. In the days following the Chinese New Year, there was a notable improvement in China's A shares as they rebounded to reach the 3,000 point mark. Interestingly, there seems to be a lack of optimism among observers, and instead, more people are discussing the possibility of Asia's experiencing a downturn. Could this be another instance of financial analysts spreading pessimistic views? The reason behind this shift in sentiment is linked to some unofficial information circulating around, a rumor or perhaps an advanced prediction. Let's reflect on the period from last year to the present. It seems that apart from China's Asia's global stock market have been experiencing a widespread surge. Notably, India's total market value has exceeded that of Hong Kong, the Nikkei index has reached new heights, and even amid the ongoing geopolitical tensions, Taiwan's stock market recorded a substantial 27% growth in 2023, securing its place among the top five global stock markets. Despite the challenges posed by the Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes, the U.S. stock market, driven by seven major tech stocks and the AI trend, has been steadily advancing. Following the Chinese New Year, China's A-shares, which had been persistently gloomy, appear to be making a comeback. This gives the Communist Party an opportunity for some positive narratives. Yet, let's explore the origin of this recent bullish trend. Despite the Shanghai Composite Index reclaiming the 3,000 point mark, it's important to note that only around one tenth of the almost 5,000 listed stocks on the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges have genuinely risen. Since the start of the year, just over 200 stocks have shown an increase of over 10%, while more than 3,000 stocks have seen a decline of over 10%. Some may draw parallels with the U.S. stock market, but can you imagine if major Wall Street indices were, were manipulated by the U.S. government? The current scenario in Asia involves state-controlled funds strategically supporting a handful of stocks to maintain stability in market indices. However, this effort appears to be more for show, and it's essential not to prematurely anticipate a bull market in Asia. The Communist Party might be encouraging market participation, but it seems to be a strategy to exploit investors. Trying to profit at the expense of state-backed funds is a risky venture, and attempting to outsmart them could lead to significant losses. It can be argued that all the traditional means for Chinese individuals to appreciate and safeguard their assets have now dwindled. Currently, acquiring property is challenging. Stocks are manipulated, financial products can be uh, precarious, and even savings aren't entirely secure. Making money has become challenging, and many are finding it increasingly difficult to preserve their existing assets. The number of individuals with modest funds feeling trapped appears to be growing. Typically, if you possess real estate or cash, you wouldn't just allow your asset to depreciate, right? You'd always be contemplating potential investment opportunities, even if it's just exploring one avenue. However, this basic desire is increasingly difficult to satisfy in present-day China. Those who stay informed about current events might have heard about the growing trend of Chinese individuals illegally immigrating to the United States, a phenomenon that has garnered attention from major English-language media outlets. Some foreign observers humorously remark that these individuals seem to dress better than themselves. Rumors even circulate, suggesting that the Mexican cartels along the migration route have shifted from their traditional activities to now running business like fried rice stores and convenience stores, creating an unexpectedly jovial atmosphere. I believe that anyone with a hint of rationality would recognize that these middle-class individuals resorting to illegal immigration must be aware that, in comparison to their lives in China, their future in the United States might, might experience temporary or even permanent setbacks across various aspects. 
not to mention the significant issue of legal status. There are reports indicating that locations like uh, uh, Monterey Park in Los Angeles are currently in disarray. So why do they still opt for this path, persistently attempting to illegally immigrate to the United States? The answer seems quite simple. It's because they no longer perceive hope in China. To the extent that they are willing to take the risk of crossing borders, perhaps they believe that immigration could offer them a chance for a positive turnaround in their lives. This parallels what we are discussing about the stock market today. If we take the four stock market circuit breakers during the 2020 pandemic in the US as a starting point, followed by the quantitative easing rebound in 2021, the bear market during the interest rate hikes in 2022, and the continuous market highs driven by Magnificent Seven in 2023 up to the present day. It's evident that each pullback in the US stock market over these years has presented a favorable opportunity for investors to increase their holdings. This pattern continues even today, with no reported regrets from those who bought in but only from those who missed the chance. Why? Because there is, a, there is confidence in its ability to recover. The ascent of artificial intelligence marks an era where the United States is spearheading further advancements in labor productivity, once again leading the way in technological progress. What is the present condition of China's Asia? Is it necessary to rely on gloomy financial commentators to dis dissect it? Admittedly, it has rebounded to 3,000 points, but to be honest, apart from nationalists steering clear of stock trading, who else exhibit confidence in Asia's? Faced with considerable debt, declining housing prices, assets offering limited appreciation prospects, various pitfalls for investors, and the educational hurdles for the next generation, individuals in the middle class and affluent sectors discover little choice but to explore alternative avenues, including contemplating the possibility of illegal immigration. Observing the daily news about Asia feels akin to enjoying a comedy performance. The China Security Regulatory Commission, securities firms, private equity funds, financial experts, they all appear as actors, consistently delivering entertaining content. Let's delve into the latest amusing developments in this ongoing comedy of safeguarding a share market. Since assuming office, the newly appointed chairman of the China Securities Regulatory Commission, Wu Qing, has been actively fostering a work culture characterized by dedication, professionalism, impartiality, and a strong focus on individual investors. Consequently, during the Chinese New Year, he diligently worked overtime issuing penalties. Immediately after the holiday, Chairman Wu personally led a meeting, inviting experts from various fields for discussions. This diverse group included representatives from listed companies, security firms, foreign financial institutions, and more. Chairman Wu respectfully sought their insights, aiming for collaborative efforts to ensure the stable development of the capital market in China. Notably, despite inviting participants from various sectors of the financial industry, not a single one of them represented quantitative hedge funds. The attending experts, being astute, quickly discerned the Chairman Wu's intention. Consequently, they proposed a valuable suggestion to impose stringent measures against quantitative hedge funds, which they deemed as the primary culprits behind the decline in Asia. Chairman Wu expressed great satisfaction after listening to the experts, affirming their acumen. They quickly identified issues plaguing A shares. Consequently, the two-day symposium held from February 18th to February 19th concluded on a positive note. On the following day, February 20th, both the Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Shenzhen Stock Exchange imposed penalties on Ningbo Lingjun, a quantitative hedge fund. The reason behind this punishment was the concentrated selling of stocks by multiple products managed by Ningbo Lingjun during the first minute of trading on February 19th.
The Shanghai Stock Exchange sold 11.95 billion and the Shenzhen Stock Exchange sold 13.72 billion, summing up to 25 billion. This concerted selling activity swiftly brought down the indices of both markets, disrupting regular trading order and violating relevant rules of both exchanges. Consequently, the fund faced sanctions including a three-day trading suspension and a public condemnation. Ningbo Linjun holds significant influence as one of the four prominent figures in the realm of domestic quantitative private equity funds, managing assets that currently exceed 600 billion yuan. The Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Shenzhen Stock Exchange imposed penalties on the fund, citing the reason that during the first minute of trading, Ningbo Linjun engaged in concentrated stock selling, thereby violating a specific trading rule. What is this rule? It states that program trading involving the generation or issuance of trading instructions through computer programs should not impact the security of our system or disrupt normal trading order. However, this broad statement raises questions about what kind of quantitative trading truly disrupts, disrupts the normal trading order as it lacks specific details. Determining whether it is a violation for quantitative equity funds to engage in concentrated selling at the market open is subjective. In my perspective, it may not be a violation. Consider the scenario where you have leveraged the positions and the stock prices suddenly drop, breaching the liquidation threshold. In such cases, brokerage can forcefully sell all your stocks, and this liquidation process is immediate and concentrated, not gradual. However, brokerage are not deemed to be in violation in such situation. A similar case applies to major shareholders who pledge their stocks to banks. When the liquidation threshold is breached, banks can sell the stocks in a concentrated manner, often triggering a limited down situation. In these instances, do you consider brokerages and banks engaged in rule violating trades? They are conducting bulk sell-offs, causing a significant impact on the market, including potential index declines. If brokerages and the banks can initiate massive sell-offs, why should quantitative equity funds be prohibited from concentrating on selling stocks? The stock they are selling were initially purchased, not borrowed. Why is it that when they buy stocks, it's not considered inflating the A-share market, but when they sell, it's labeled as malicious shorting? Buying and selling are inherent aspects of market activities, constituting normal trading behavior. Upon a careful examination of Ningbo Lingjun's trading records on February 19, the reasons behind their disciplinary action become apparent. On that day, Ningbo Lingjun liquidated positions in the Shanghai and the Shenzhen 300 index, the CSI 500 index, and the CSI 1000 index, while concurrently increasing exposure in the CSI 2000 indexes. Essentially, it was a strategic portfolio adjustment. However, the notable aspect is that the stocks they sold coincided with those the national team was actively acquiring, essentially profiting from the national team's investments. Furthermore, Ningbo Linjun explicitly mentioned in their investor reports, in special market conditions influenced significantly by the national team's funds, adjustments are made during trading to enhance the win rate. This statement is a clear provocation to the national team, justifying the subsequent disciplinary action. The primary reasons for Ningbo Linjun's penalty lie in their lack of EQ, excessive publicity, and audacity to capitalize on the national team's investment while openly disclosing it. Such behavior warranted a reprimand from the national team. Without the T plus zero trading advantage, quantitative equity funds in the Asia market are left with only one viable strategy targeting the national team. This is an undeniable reality. The key to earning profits lies in anticipating the movements of the national team's funds. However, daring to capitalize on the national team, whether through sophisticated analysis or insider information is met with severe consequences, is considered a capital offense. This is the true essence of China's securities laws.
All other regulations are essentially secondary. The core principle boils down to one rule, no harvesting gains from the national team. Consequently, the landscape of Chinese quantitative equity funds appears increasingly challenging, with T plus zero trading restrictions and the prohibition of profiting from the national team constraining their ability to generate returns in the Asia market. The current stance of the China Securities Regulatory Commission is unmistakable. With quantitative equity funds essentially obsolete, the focus now is on vehemently condemning them, depicting them as the primary culprits responsible for the bearish trend in the A share market. By assigning blame to quantitative equity funds, the aim is to divert retail investors' attention away from issues like chaotic issuance of IPOs and substantial reductions in holdings by major shareholders. The narrative suggests that without quantitative equity funds, China's A-share market could potentially transition into a bull market. However, it's crucial to bear in mind that the quantitative equity funds only emerged in China around a decade ago. The introduction of the Sunshine Private Equity Management measures occurred in 2013. And during the stock market crash in 2015, many individuals were still unfamiliar with the term quantitative equity funds. Therefore, it's pertinent to question whether the stock market crash in 2015 was genuinely caused by the liquidation actions of quantitative equity funds. A glance at the US stock market make it evident. Despite the presence of numerous short positions and quantitative equity funds, the market consistently experiences growth. Therefore, the persistent bearish conditions in China's Asia market isn't solely the result of a specific investment institution. Rather, it reflects broader issues within the entire market, from regulatory bodies to brokerage to listed companies, systemic problems persist. A share were essentially established to facilitate state-owned enterprises in exploiting retail investors. Since its inception, it has functioned as a fraudulent center, making it highly unlikely for retail investors to consistently achieve profits. In recent days, there has been a circulating rumor that the China Security Regulatory Commission has imposed a restriction on certain companies, prohibiting them from selling more stocks than they buy in the first and the last 30 minutes of trading. This rumor underscores the regulatory measures taken by the CSRC, starting with constraints on stock sales during specific time intervals, extending to limitations on sales for specific major stakeholders, and potentially culminating in a scenario where selling stocks becomes universally restricted with legal consequences. Given the escalating regulatory measures, some may speculate whether the Asia market is heading towards closure. If selling stocks becomes universally restricted, it implies a lack of buyers as well, raising concerns about the potential for market closure. This brings to mind an interesting anecdote. Before Yi Hui Man, Liu Shi Yu served as the chairman of the China Security Regulatory Commission. Despite frequently emphasizing the need for strict market supervision, Liu Shi Yu often made sudden regulatory changes due to his limited familiarity with China's security laws, leading to frequent basic errors. Eventually, some investors frustrated with this situation decided to send him books on security laws in the hope that Chairman Liu would earnestly study them. It raises questions about awkwardness and embarrassment of the situation, highlighting the consistently subpar regulatory competence of the CSRC. The current Chairman Wu Qing seems to continue the tradition of regulatory incompetence. However, he puts on quite a performance, fully immersing himself in the role, providing us with some entertaining value. Originally, the Asia market is a casino set up by the Communist Party, often involved in some deception to extract money from gamblers. But now, the situation is getting uglier. They only allow you to exchange money for chips, but won't let you cash out the chips. With such restrictions, who would dare to play in this casino?
It seems inevitable that this casino will eventually close its doors. Whether the Communist Party manages the stock market incompetently with numerous loopholes or overregulates leading to its demise, it always serves as a negative example for the world. In any case, providing a daily dose of amusing drama gives at least a sense of existence. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and a subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.